Hello and welcome to Amare, the beautiful new home of the Royal Conservatoire of The Hague here in the Netherlands. My name is Walter Reiter and I'm privileged to be one of the Baroque violin teachers here. For around half a century, this conservatoire has been at the forefront of the early music movement, training young performers from all over the world to play music in an historically informed manner. Here, you can learn to play music of, from the Renaissance to the Romantic period. Most students, however, specialize in the music of the Baroque and Classical periods, studying the string instruments, bowed or plucked, the wind, brass, and the keyboard instruments, all of which Bach himself would instantly recognize where he to stop by. On the other hand, were he to attend a concert of the symphony orchestra that also has its home here in Amari, he would most definitely be puzzled, for the construction and the sound of every single instrument that Bach and his contemporaries played and composed for has radically changed over the centuries. Indeed, I know of only one instrument from the Baroque period that hasn't changed, the triangle. As a teacher of historical performance, I am frequently asked to lead projects with modern players, and I have to confess that I'm usually, well, saddened to discover that so many of them have never played a single note of 17th century music. That's a whole century of fabulously inventive, often deeply spiritual violin music. Indeed, some would argue that the 17th century was the most inventive and exciting period in the history of the violin, because that was when it first stormed onto the world's stage, singing like a human voice, dazzling with ever more complicated pyrotechnics as it rapidly developed the unique instrumental idiom on which all later violin music, including that of Bach, was to be based. Now, the truth is that the term Baroque music is misleading. Better to call it the music of the period roughly between 1600 and the mid 18th century. During this time, styles were changing as rapidly as, as popular music does today, from decade to decade, from country to country, even city to city. And one could reasonably argue that exploring this rich, diverse repertoire as we do here in some way simulates the creative laboratory in which Bach himself forged his musical language. For throughout his life, Bach studied the music of other composers, copying it out, dissecting it, if you like, the works of his contemporaries in Germany, in France and Italy, and also of much earlier composers going right back to the 16th century. And that is why there is no doubt in my mind that studying the pre-Bach repertoire, placing Bach's music in an historical context, gives one an entirely different perspective on his music than if, as is common today, one's musical training is rooted in the romantic and post-romantic tradition, its sound world, its aesthetics, its passions. My violin, which today would be known as a Baroque violin, but which in Bach's time was simply known as a violin, was made in Germany in almost the exact year that Bach put together his book of solo violin music. But fortunately, when most violins were being altered to meet the demands of later composers and of larger concert halls, this one was never touched. So it's still in its original condition. And I'll briefly explain to you what that means. The neck of this violin in common with all the old violins that we revere, like Amati, Stradivarius, Guarnerius, etc., enters the body at an angle of 90 degrees. This means that the bridge is low and the sound far more mellow. The act of conversion involved chopping off the scroll, well, maybe chopping off is too harsh, surgically removing the scroll and detaching the neck and the fingerboard. A new, longer neck was now built that entered the body at an angle so that the new bridge could be higher. And this made the sound more powerful, which you might think of as progress, but it also made it less gentle and, in my opinion, less suitable for the intimate nature of much of the Baroque repertoire.
The fingerboard was also replaced by a longer one, so the player could reach higher notes. And the original scroll, to some extent the aesthetic showpiece of the maker, was grafted onto the new neck. And there were other modifications too. The strings were made of sheep gut, as they were well into the 20th century. I use pure gut for the E, A and D, and wound gut for the G but some of my colleagues use a pure gut G as well. The violin was held on the E string side without any chin rest. It was not held on the G string side until the end of the 18th century. There was no standard pitch. It varied from 465 hertz in the early 1600s in Venice, that's a modern B flat, right down to 392 hertz for French opera which is a modern G natural. We try to be faithful to historical pitches, but we also have a standard international pitch of 415 hertz, a modern G sharp. Now, I'm going to take a moment to show you a Baroque bow. Again, we call it a Baroque bow, but this one was also the kind of bow that, for example, the young Mozart played with when performing his concertos in Salzburg in the, in the 1770s. When did he have time to practice? The essential quality of this bow is its ability to clarify the difference between important notes and less important notes. Because so much of Baroque music is rhetorical, more like speech than melody. There are very few melodies, real melodies, in solo Bach. And what is more, speech that convinces, that is persuasive. That's why music and rhetoric are so closely related, and it is why Bach himself studied the art of rhetoric. So just as in speech there must be a perspective between important syllables and less important ones, just as in art there is light and shade, chiaroscuro, so it is in music. And this bow can accomplish this to perfection, because the point is lighter than the frog. So it has its own built-in dynamic qualities, with down bows naturally stronger than up bows. That the modern bow was specifically designed to iron out these differences. So it is better for the later repertoire, but less suitable for the earlier, including the music of Bach. Remember, it's the bow, the speaking, singing, dancing bow, with its subtleties of articulation, that is at the heart of Baroque playing. Now, there are so many elements in the interpretive process, but I believe that reproducing the sounds that the composer would have heard in his imagination as he wrote must surely be one of the most basic. After all, sound is the raw material of music. It is what music is made of. And Bach was profoundly interested in the actual sound of the instruments he wrote for. He knew how to exploit the unique quality, the special tone color of each one of them, and to blend them so perfectly. Why else would he be so particular about using, for example, three different kind of oboes? The usual one, the tai, the da caccia, an instrument, by the way, whose construction Bach supervised personally, and the amore, even at times blending them together. Or why would he sometimes specify the viola da gamba rather than the cello, even on occasion writing for the old viols? Every sound we hear affects us in a different way. And I guess one of our aims as historically informed performers is to bring back to life those distant sounds that are inseparable from the musical culture to which Bach both as performer and composer, belonged. But now it's time for some playing. I'm very happy to be welcoming Phoebe, who's from Athens, Greece, and she will play for us the start of the G minor solo sonata by Bach. Oh, and I've asked Phoebe to begin with to play from the edition by Henrik Schering.
Thank you. Now, a few textual comments to begin with. Bach was a violinist, you know. A lot of people think of him as sitting up there, a lonely figure in the organ loft, improvising, but he could play these pieces. So he knew exactly what effect he wanted by his bowings. In bar two, in your edition, the single bow that Bach writes is divided not into two, but into three bows. And I think that's a mistake. Of course, it produces more sound, but do we really need more sound? What you lose is that intimacy, that spirit of improvisation, if you like, that is essential. So can we hear, first of all, just from the third chord and then with the bowing that Bach actually wrote? Yes, this changes the feeling completely, doesn't it, from something of bravura to something more wistful, intimate and improvised. The other important question is dynamics. Now, in this book, there is not a single dynamic marking. Bach wrote nothing except when there were echoes that he wanted. But deciding on dynamics is an essential and fascinating aspect of the interpretive process. One that compels us to engage more closely with the text. For the dynamics are concealed within the body of the music. For example, in the relation of one note to another and one harmony to another. Now, Bach always wrote his bass lines first, and his compositions are based on that basic harmonic structure that we have. So what I'd like you to do now is to play just the bass line, and we can see from that bass line what the overall dynamic picture is. Lovely, thank you very much. That suggests a basic dynamic scheme which you rightly observed. The first note soft, the second growing, the third climactic, if you like, and the fourth retreating back, sinking back to where it started. Now, in Bach's time, they talked a lot about affect, the way, literally, the way the music affects us as human beings. That's of fundamental importance. It's even written about as the very purpose of music to stir the passions. Before we explore the effects of these chords, we should remember that Bach put together this book following the death of his wife, Maria Barbara. And he wrote it as a kind of epitaph, a monument, if you like, to aloneness. And that's why he calls it Say Solo, Thou Art Alone. And it is why he begins the book in G minor, which is a a melancholy kind of uh, um, uh, uh, tonality. It's evoking sadness, not power or aggression. The first chord, let's examine it, is spacious, revealing the two open strings, the two bottom open strings. And I feel that that is Bach showing us, if you like, the raw material of the violin, the, the material from which the master will forge his masterpiece. So let's hear the first chord um, in that melancholy, spacious, lofty mood, and not as a powerful. And remember, there is one bass note. So nobody would have started on bare fifth in those days, neither on the violin nor on the harpsichord, but one single bass note. Well, that's lovely, yeah. That immediately engages us in that mood of melancholy. The second chord is very different. Unlike the first, it's dissonant. Unlike the first, it's compressed, crushed, 
almost, evoking grief or conflict, although it is later resolved. Lovely. And the third chord, which is doubly dissonant, so a seventh and an augmented fourth, donates, uh, 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 denotes something like uh, protestation or yearning. Let's try and get that impression. Before it sinks back into where it came from. Lovely. Now, let's talk about the passages that connect these harmonic pillars. In Bach's time, most Italian-style composers would have written simply the bass line with some figures to denote the harmonies and a skeleton of the top part. We're going to play with Eduardo here at the harpsichord. We're going to play the beginning of the third sonata by Corelli, as Corelli himself wrote it. Quite nice, you may say, if you wish to be polite. But that's not how any 18th century composer would actually have played it. He would have taken the skeleton that we just played and transformed it into something living, something of himself. Here's an example. Now, Bach was criticized in his time for writing his own ornaments, like the ones in our adagio, for how could a performer breathe life into a composition while being forced to abdicate his role as improviser? We, on the other hand, have good reason to be grateful that Bach, the greatest improviser of all time, meticulously wrote out his own improvisations. Unfortunately, however, Bach's writing out of his ornaments has led to a tradition of misguided obedience to the letter rather than to the spirit of the musical text, the rhythms executed with an exactitude that wholly cancels out Bach's concept of written-out improvisation. The problem in performance, therefore, is to be faithful to the written text while still conveying the impression of spontaneous invention. I think of these ornaments as messengers, if you like, guiding us from one harmony to the other, beginning in one affect and transforming themselves mid-flight into another. Let's see how Phoebe copes with this paradox, obeying the spirit, if not precisely the letter, of Bach's written rhythms. Now for something completely different. Let us consider the Lourdes from Bach's E major partita. And I'm going to ask Phoebe to play it, the start of it, in the way many of you will be used to hearing it, which I would call a more modern lyrical style.
very beautiful playing. But forgive me if I suggest that the one thing that did not sound like was a dance. Would you agree? From the point of view of authenticity, it was way too lyrical. The crispness of the lure rhythms um, melodized out, if you like, into something much more like a song than a dance. So let's see to what extent a few choice morsels of historical information about the lure can transform your performance. To begin with, the sources refer to the lure as being like a slow jig, and we should remember that the French jig, as opposed to the Italian giga, has a more has a dotted rhythm, a sotio rhythm, something like this. Now, if I slow that down, we'll find, yes, there's a lot of resemblance even to the rhythm of Bach's lure. I'll slow it right down. Now, I don't know how Bach came to hear about the lure. It had only just come into fashion um, after Louis XIV had heard one he liked in 1701. Perhaps Bach had come across Couperin's lure from his eighth concert, entitled in the theatrical style, and marked pesamment heavily. Brossard tells us that the lure should be beaten slowly and gravely, marking the first beat stronger than the second beat. And this works well in this lure as it will in Bach's lure. Others speak of the lure as being dignified and slow, Matheson adding that they exhibit a proud and arrogant nature. So, Eduardo, let's play Couperin's lure slowly, gravely, proudly, and in a dignified manner. You will have noticed how sophisticated and intricate the rhythms of Couperin's lure are, as indeed are those of Bach's lure. Now, Kvantz, who knew Bach well, tells us that in the lure, the dotted notes and the non-dotted notes are all played with a detached, articulated stroke. So shall we try hearing your version of the lure, separating the quarter notes and the eighth notes to make them short and crisp. That is indeed far more like a lure, far more like a dance. But Kvantz tells us something else. He says that the quavers, or the eighth notes, um, must be shorter than written, their written value, and that the dotted crotchets, dotted quarter notes, must be much longer. So this ties in with what Bach's cousin, Walter, writes in 1732, that the first note of each half bar has a dot which must be well prolonged. So now I'm excited to hear it again, not with a mathematically exact rhythm, but with the application of this crucial historical information.
wonderful. We're really transforming this lure, aren't we? That's lovely to hear. Now, finally, a word about Boeing's, the choice of Boeing's. Each dance has its unique character and mood, its rhythms and accents and phrase lengths, often surprisingly irregular, as in the lure. And the steps of the dancer and the movement of the bow must be coordinated if the execution is to be successful. And for this reason, knowing how a dance was actually danced and how bowings were actually executed for this particular dance will bring us much closer to a successful rendering of this lure. Even if, as in the case with both our Couperin lure and the Bach lure, these dances were not actually written for the ballroom. Fortunately, we do have examples both of original choreographies and of original bowings. And I'm going to ask you to play your final version using the bowings suggested by the French violinist Monteclair in his 1711 violin method. I've written them out for you. Let's use Monteclair's bowings and see what our final version of the lure sounds like. Now, in purely instrumental music, we use these bowings, these historical bowings, as a starting point only, adapting them to the character of the individual piece. And this is a crucial point that I wish to make clear, for there are those who fear that historically informed interpretation in some way cancels out the concept of artistry. In some insidious way suppressing the individual voice of the performer. But this is absolutely not the case. A dozen musicians, all historically informed, will all play differently. Perhaps that is one of the intangible mysteries of music making. Thank you for watching. If you are interested in pursuing the historical approach to playing, Walter Reiter's book, the Baroque Violin and Viola, a 50-lesson course, is published by Oxford University Press. <laughs>